I was wondering if we can speak about uh, life and death, those two phenomena, mm -hmm. and uh, death being the counterpart of life. But first, there's a sutta, and it's called uh, fragile or perishable. It says, Bhikkhus, I will teach you fr the fragile and the unfragile, the perishable and the unperishable. What is the fragile and what is the unfragile? Form is the fragile. Its cessation, subsiding, passing away is the unfragile. So feeling is the fragile. Perception is the fragile. Intentions are fragile. Consciousness is fragile. Their cessation, subsiding, passing away is unfragile, unperishable. That fact of their change mm remains mm. so those things those particular things change in various ways they're subject to change but one thing that is not uh, up for debate or mm. subject to change mm. is that yeah, yeah they're ending so in terms of like we have the phenomenon of life And its counterpart. So here's life, everything that I'm ex experiencing now, the the, the all, if, if I can say that. Yeah. Uh, myself included. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Everything, and the background to that is this change, is this death. You gotta understand death as that background of death is implicit. So, because it's usually like uh, death is perceived to be something at the end of the life. Yeah. Like when when the, when that time comes, then death will arrive, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But actually, death is already here through the fact that you were manifested, that you were born. Already implies, <coughs> as we say say often, like the. Um, the manifestation of a thing, anything, any phenomenon, big or small, far or near, doesn't matter. Manifestation of a thing is its impermanence. The fact that it's manifested, the fact that it came to be, it's incomprehensible to you to stop that or prevent that. It's just, it's inaccessible. The, the manifestation of things, the presentation of phenomena, it's, it's just something that's completely outside of your scope. So, death kind of it's on obviously it's on that level. It's just in this uh, in a general sense. If you take a the phenomenon of your life, the all that happens while you're alive, well, the implication of that life is that it is that it has come to be. It's manifested. So its cessation is implicit in its manifestation. That's what the Buddha said. Like those who are. Um, unmindful mm -hmm. they're as if dead already like you don't have to wait to die in order to be within death all you need to do is uh, exist within the Mara's domain or within the domain of that which implies death that's already as if dead because death is there through that implication right, 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 right. because if you see so if you see life uh, you you will see its counterpart existing in the background. Mm. Its is, implication. It, it's, its implication. Yeah. It's yeah. it's it cannot arise without that implication of death. Life. What do you mean cannot arise? I mean, uh, you know, the fact that it is manifested. Yeah, it cannot be conceived apart, separate from. Yeah. It cannot be conceived without mm. that implication, in the broadest sense mm. of that of that word. So the point is, it's like, well, think of it like, like a simile. Say somebody is living within a waiting trap. The big trap is just waiting to crush you. You're completely unaware of the trap. You're completely unaware of the, the thing hanging over your head. But you have absolutely, well, by being completely unaware that it's a trap, you've absolutely 
no notion of escape. And even if you were to, if, even if somebody tell you, oh, it's a trap, like you, you don't even know where to begin. Like you don't even recognize it. You don't even know that there is anything to be escaped or how to be escaped. That's pretty much the existence of, of, uh, of anyone who is living within the sensual domain with the wrong view, I being Kutujina. So they are as if dead already. Like, yes, technically, their life, their birth is still manifested there because they're still existing, but within the domain of the inevitable trap, inevitable cessation of that. And, and you can see there and then while they're in that state, by not having the right view, by not being, being a sense restrained, you know, that like they, they don't even know, they don't even have a notion of the escape. And as such, they might as well be dead <coughs> already. So, uh, so there's the other, if you, if you cultivate the context of death, mm. then you cannot, you, you cannot delight in life. You yeah. you you'll turn away from life, or uh, as it says in the Sutta, uh, upeka will be established, mm. um, or the counterpart will be established. But meaning the context will be clear, death in the background, implicit. If you cultivate that, well, there you go again on the basis of the same simile. If you if you get the right view and you recognize the trap as a trap, you recognize that whatever has the nature of arising, that's why it's impermanent. Yep. Whatever has the nature to manifest that is its impermanence you recognize the extent of the trap so if you then contemplate the existence of the implication of death in everything in every in breath in every out breath as the suttas would say it's implicit it's like implicit. if that context and we said it before but you know it doesn't hurt to, to um, repeat it the contemplation of death in the suttas that's often talk, talked about when it says like a monk should contemplate within an in breath within an out breath he shouldn't like he should contemplate death it doesn't mean he's doing it on the level it just means that his knowledge his um, correct uh, concurrent attending to the implicit death of this life permeates even the most immediate action of breathing so you contemplate death on the level of in breath and out breath not by watching sensations of in breath and out breath you contemplate it by developing that background context of the implication of that death so so thoroughly that even breathing mm. will remain cannot remain unaffected by that context. Yeah, any even the the core of life, exactly. the sign of life, exactly. even breath, even the most heartbeat neutral kind of um, habitual mm. action that you generally take for granted. So even 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 that will will be permeated by the significance of the implication of death. And you do that not just for the sake of, you know, contemplate death so hard to, to reach that point where you just kind of, boom, you just step outside of it and you're free. You contemplate it so that there is a complete dispassion towards anything regarding life. And that's how you step outside of it. And that's how you're free. When there is no more passion towards that is that, well, that removes you, place, basically cancels you within that uh, implication of death. So in other words, you disappear from the trap. Let's put it that way. Because you have no issue. If, if a random trap falls, if you are not in that trap, like it's not, it's not your problem, cannot be your problem. So it's only a problem when you are the one who's going to be trapped. Or hit by that thing. So it. So obviously, o ordinarily, people will. Everybody knows, I'm going to die. Mm. But that thought stands for something abstract mm. in yeah. the future. Stands for the idea of death, which is like a very much, as I said. Uh, misconceived notion of something that will happen at the end, whenever that end is, and so on, in the future with but the it, time. But it's so uh, disconnected from this yeah. life. Yeah, you don't wait for you don't. Well, like if you know, if if you need to wait for the actual dying to yeah. contemplate death, it's too late. Yeah. You know, you contemplate it within life, yeah. within that which was born, within that birth, mm -hmm. within that manifestation. 
but it although people know that mm. or well, well they already when they think it's at the end of my life mm. that is at the end it's mm. in the future um, even if you had to cultivate that thought every day for example I'm, uh, like some stoics might have done mm. not that they did exactly this but maybe at the end of their day they might think well I might die tomorrow mm. or you know death is coming and so on and and they might cultivate that particular thought abstract thought about death being in the future not in the sense that we were talking about but mm. being somewhere else at some other point yeah not connected Later. with yeah not connected yeah. with it's like a different thing it is yeah yeah uh, they don't see it in the heart mm, of their own of the present life. existence yeah. so you, a person like that who if they had to somehow find the effort to do that every day mm. have those abstract notions of death still might be a bit more careful yeah no in, in sure general, it, it's better than being completely like ignorant or 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 or, or like um uh deluded in regard to it mm. of course like it's it's better to not forget that you that you will die even in that kind of abstract secondary remote sense that usual kind of um, idea of death is for people um, it's it's better than nothing mm. but like the, when the buddha was describing the contemplation of that 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 leads to like the quickest way mm. of this passion and arahantship it has to be taken very very differently much more acutely much more precisely and much more profusely if you were thinking about death as an abstra abstract thing in the future coming and your mind becomes more uh, grateful for the present things of life mm -hmm. your mind goes into the direction of delighting in life really appreciating mm. all the moments and all the things that can happen uh, I think that is a sign that you are not connecting this. Th these Correct. Things, yeah. You yeah. know, oh, that's very nice. Well, again, take the grateful. simile of the trap. See, if you're contemplating, uh, pretty much any life. contemplation, yeah, life if it's done acutely, uh, death if it's done acutely. Um, trap contemplation of a trap acutely, you recognize that, oh, it's not something that will come later it's right there now as i think it it's hanging over my head would you then spend time going around saying thank you to other people within the same trap and expressing your gratitude you might say it in passing if it comes up while you are being preoccupied with how to free myself from the impending thing that's going to crash on my head in this trap mm -hmm. I'm so grateful so for it's, this it's fate. Like, ex exactly. Like, so it's, even when people contemplate it, in that sense you described, those people, not everybody, but then that um, death is, 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 um, is still in kind of removed. So it's like, yes, it's a trap and everything, but the fact that you think you have time to express gratitude and, and sort things out and, and appreciate things, you wouldn't appreciate stuff if you are aware of the imminent danger of that stuff. So only when that imminence is removed, you can kind of, okay, let me deal with this and then I'll deal with it when it comes. But it's like recognizing the imminence, the implicit yeah. this The life yeah. is the trap. The life yeah, is the death. Yeah. The death, you know, yeah. it, the it cannot have it otherwise. Nope. Impossible. Impossible. But it's like the separation you, because people see, see it separately. Yes, the separation so because of the, the accumulated wrong mm. views. So they don't see it simultaneously as the counterpart to life right there. Is, exactly. is surrounded, it's, it's, it's shell. No. Or and they don't see it simultaneously because seeing things simultaneously requires training against the grain, against the directionality of your senses, of your <laughs> mind, of, of, of everything you know. So you can't do it accidentally, you can't accidentally stumble upon the clear image and the relationship between life and death that would result in the immediate dispassion you become an arahant but you can through repetition and through kind of digging up that way against the grain of your senses against the grain of life against that flow of you know forward movement so to speak that's generally it's how people people's lives uh, go so it takes that effort to swim against the current And one of the obvious um, ways of doing that is 
taking on the precept celibacy sense restraint and then the contemplation of that uh, that like death however um remote delayed non-imminent might have been it's gonna start narrowing down because you are uh, not maintaining the cover-up of the imminence of death through your actions of sensuality or will non-restraint you're containing sort of engagement it. and uh, you're containing and then you're going to start discerning it on the right level so those who are mindful of death well that's it see not being forgetful of that context is the beginning of that right mindfulness that's what Buddha said those who are forgetful i.e. those who are unmindful they're as if dead already and only those who are mindful have an opportunity have the to uh, yeah eventually to penetrate it on that acute level and understand and see it they would then result not as i said in some magical mystical experience but in complete dispassion towards anything concerned with life mm. doesn't mean they delight in death either they just mean they contemplate it sufficiently enough to to cancel out delight in life and that's enough for liberation so s someone gets that uh, context of death how do they remember it you know how do you keep it going throughout the day oh well, you, you're going to be forgetting life. it you'll be you'll be getting distracted you 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 keep yourself from drifting away too far from it by uh policing and restraining your own actions which are delighting in it which would be exactly which would be countering that context of death see if you're acting out of sensuality you have to put life first you have to put the pleasure of life even even more first mm. Um, and that's already a, a serious perversion of that actual order. And whenever you pervert the order, you cover up what's implicit in the right in that order. So by by delighting in life, by perpetuating, proliferating delight through acts of sensuality, acting out of ill will, acting out of hindrances regarding life and things that come up within that life, you are uh, covering up the implication of death in it. And every, every time you cover it up, the view that death is something later gets established more and more. And if, I suppose you also have to feel that threat. Yeah, yeah. Because it's an immediate threat. Mm. It's not you certainly would initially. Uh, mm. That's why it's, it's very important if you want to go down the down this route of contemplating death in similar contexts you better have your aggregate of virtue properly established because otherwise the mind is just going to start freaking out in regard to everything because it and it, it will realize that there is no shelter up down above below behind forward anything in any direction i go to seek shelter for myself it's under death it's under the rule of death it's in death it is implicit thus it's not safe Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so only person they will not be overwhelmed by that is the person who already contained the mind from spilling over too far in, in this irrational attempts of seeking seeking safety that would then result in its own derangement because in, in, in a way if, so if your aggregate of virtue is developed mm. then it's even though death is that threat to life it can feel as it, a threat and everything, but it will be contained because yeah, yeah. you have contained that which is under the threat of death so although you still have some horses in that race, so to speak, in other words, you're not completely, fully dispassionate towards life, you have, con you have contained all those unwholesome ways of making your dependence on that trap even worse. So when you start recognizing the trap and that which would be destroyed by the trap, you might feel some intensity, but overall it's contained because your actions have been purified beforehand. And then you can take it further. Mm. So a person would feel the threat and freak out only if they haven't contained that. Uh, yeah, they that might like again whatever that intensity might at the time might feel like the highest intensity because it's yeah. not like 
you can be outside of that experience and compare it. You know, like whatever is the current pain, it's the worst pain in, in, in everyone's life. Yeah. Whatever's current worry, it's the worst, worst worry. Yeah. Uh, but whether they're doing it rightly or not, they can see it whether how close to the, the breaking the precepts and acting out they are or not. Like in hindsight, when they look back a week ago, when I started contemplating death and so on, yes, it, it felt close, it felt acute, it felt scary, but I haven't done anything on account of it. And that will already bring confidence. Because that's the measure. Have you done anything on account of it? And how bad was it? How bad did your mind make you act? Good, yeah. So in the face of that felt intent that that threat because like well i can think about death i'm not afraid of death like many people yeah, say. yeah, yeah. when i think about death i'm not afraid of death it's not the death they're yeah, thinking about because so, uh, yeah when you feel a threat of pain a little bit what do you yeah. do yeah. well exactly there yeah, sure sure, do sure. You that's start like if uh, if a person wants to contemplate start contemplating death if they say feel like their virtue is decent They've been restraining, guarding the sense doors. They're not breaking the precepts. They're not engaging with sensuality. They're celibate and so on. And they want to practice, you know, a bit of a, <coughs> a sharper approach, such as death contemplation. Uh, you don't start by your ideas of death. You just pick up something that's dear to you and imagine it being taken away. Where that feeling of, of pain is, that's where death is. So take it and further there and practice this passion towards it but it's also yes yeah, so fi finding that those signs of death almost you know picking up that that yeah. uh, flavor of death yeah. you know seeing so imagining it's, it's exactly that's what I mean like so those flavors are actually to be found in things that you don't that somebody might not necessarily associate with death with their idea of death they're finally not getting what you want Being paired with what you don't want, being separated from what you want, all these things. Basically, Those dukkha. Are examples of dukkha. The, Wherever yeah. there is dukkha, the direction of dukkha, that's what death is. So contemplate things that would cause you suffering. And you are contemplating death. Then you take it further and it's like, yeah, so I would be afraid. I would be, I would be affected. I would suffer if I lose the loved ones. Oh, imagine how much more then so through that same dukkha of contemplating losing the loved ones, imagine losing also these senses on account of which you have your loved ones. Well, that's going to feel even worse. Yeah, so, so have, uh, imagine those things, contemplate that, but then pick up this, that, the sign of death, basically. Just pick yeah, up that feel it. Feed it. Feel it. But as again, as, as I said, only, only, only on the basis of of uh, thoroughly developed virtue because otherwise I mean this is not something that, that the Buddha was teaching to householders mm -hmm. by householders meaning people that are not celibate people that might occasionally take on virtue and you know mm -hmm. go to monastery and keep their priesthood for a week or something like because for this is not for most people who love will not be able to. who love life mm -hmm. love things in life mm -hmm. their families their children whatever getting the flavor of death it means turning away from it and forgetting about it and never thinking about it again and just yeah. indulging more into life yeah, yeah. love life even Covering harder because just just cover it up yeah. uh, and if you had to give such a person the threat of death while they were still delighting so much in that life well you get what the suttas oh describe boy. when they heard the buddha describe nibbana from their standpoint of very much cherishing life, possessions, and everything else, they would have, as the Sutta described, they fell on the ground, beating their breasts, pulling their hair, and saying, like, oh, that will kill us, that will destroy us. Yeah. It's like people in, in uh, on death row, uh, in some of these, in America, they don't, they're on death row, but they, they could uh, be executed any day. Mm. So there's always this threat. Hanging over their head, yeah. And they are not really wanting to be there. Yeah. Yeah. They would rather not distract themselves from that, which they go crazy, you know. Yeah. It's like the worst kind of uh, Well, yeah, torture. that's what that's what Dostoevsky was writing about, the, the House of Dead. In the prison, from his experience in the prison, basically, he, he saw that 
the worst punishment to give to a man that you know a man i.e. a householder that loves life that that does not see the problem in sensuality is to like have a perpetual possibility of execution like they, there were people there they were the same <coughs> their death row and they might be killed tomorrow they might not yeah. sometimes they were taken out to the gallows and then sent back and it's like unbearable mentally Mm. And they all just disintegrated, and he was he was affected by by witnessing that, because as that other sutta describes, it's like um, when the man was talking to the Buddha. You brought it up recently when it said, "Oh, you know, like we love life, um, family, sensuality, household life." The, just the idea of renunciation feels like a precipice, feels yeah. like falling into the abyss. Just yeah. the idea of renunciation is like, if renunciation scares you that much. Well, imagine how much forceful renunciation will scare you. Yeah, Death. Uh, yes. When when things are forcefully taken away from you, when you are when when but basically where 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 your own mind does the renunciation for you, like like w without you wanting it. When your senses just fail. So it's like you already get the flavor <laughs> through practicing renunciation. That's why it's just generally so scary. You say to people, "Are oh, you sad? You got to be celibate." It's like. Like you, you, you put on the greatest fear on them. It's like what forever? Like I will never experience the pleasure of the senses again. It's like it's like death. From the point of view of those whose minds are still very much imbued with sensuality and do not see danger in that trap. But seeing it as danger, no longer delighting in life which yeah, so like you brought up the example of, of a person who say uh, might experience that flavor and then double down in commitment to their life and loving life and family mm. and so on. It's like, so if somebody experiences the flavor of death, gets a hint of it, and they might they they, they recognize they're not able to like dwell on it and contemplate it rightly, at least don't cover it up twice as much as before. So allow that 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 kind of background hint of that doubt, that fear, to stay there. Okay, you don't have to go fully towards it if you have not prepared the basis of virtue, sense restraints, liberty, and so on. But at least don't cover it up. Mm -hmm. Don't completely cover it up because they were they were Putujina, they were philosophers, they were religious people. Well, they weren't so intoxicated. Yeah, they, exactly. They, and they were not withdrawn from sensuality and so on, but they did have the capacity through practice to not completely cover that up mm. and it did shape their life more wholesomely it's not ideal because they still stay putujanas but i'm saying is if somebody who also has access to the instruction of the dhamma and then practices that non-complete cover-up of death well it, it would certainly bring you even closer to the right view and then eventually you realize, you might realize that, that giving up sensuality w is not as scary as you thought it was. And you work up towards it and, and then and actually start containing your mind on that level where it matters. So if you do see it right, death rightly, and you start renouncing sensuality, start renouncing the world. Well, no, you got to start. But you, you might have that. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. in the right, beginning don't cover it up and then start renouncing yeah sure, sure, then you start, sure. that oh, can well. be a, like a wake up call basically. <laughs> I'm going to die yeah and there's no way I can there, escape it's that so to speak yeah. so how can, can you how can you e escape yeah. the implication of manifestation when you yourself anything you know about yourself any possession any ownership is just another manifestation mm. inconceivable so a person who is actually moved by that uh, thought in the uh, and starts doing things right mm. in a, in accordance with it starts to like oh, yeah. uh, let me stop being a bit careful what let me find an answer to this issue and then starts to contemplate it more and more and finds himself uh, you know virtuous dispassionate towards life mm. then as that sutta says you know either he is fully dispassionate towards life Upeka gets established mm, mm. so it's not like he's in this paranoid no, no fear no or disgust no. and hates everything exactly that that they might he might he might have episodes <coughs> of that but again with the right instruction 
which is abundant with the suttas and so on, you recognize, okay, no, it's about the whole dwelling on, on death and recollecting it and not forgetting it is just so to experience, to develop the complete dispassion towards anything concerned with life, just to that extent, not more, not less. And when that dispassion is established, you recognize, okay, so now I neither delight in that life, nor do I delight in death. I certainly don't fear it, because I have nothing to lose anymore. Whatever's here, will have to not be here. Yeah. Because it's here. Yeah. No, for no other reason. But seeing life, you, but seeing it correctly, that you will see, well, when you, you're basically contemplating in each of their mm. life, mm. counterpart, death. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. You just... And uh, the realization, it's not mine. <laughs> this is never was mine. Well, exactly. Through this passion, because passion maintains the ownership. Acting out of passion maintains the ownership. Mm. Possession, consumption, all these all these notions, all these phenomena, it's just how you maintain the ownership. The ownership. Yeah. When you realize that, when you start contemplating and establish the context that's, that's uh, incompatible with the growth of passion towards things, the mind just can't go in that direction because of the whole framework of death that's being seen in regard to it. Like, you go and reach this fruit to eat it easily, <coughs> you enjoy it, well, then you suddenly recognize through discernment that there is a massive axe waiting to chop your hand each time you reach for the fruit. Oh, <laughs> the significance, the joy of the fruit very much changes. It becomes actually dangerous. So the taste hasn't changed. It all remained the same. It still tastes the same. Mm. The greatest fruit ever known to man. But now you see a, a, an axe waiting to fall. And it's like, oh, it's not the same thing anymore, isn't it? So the mind will not go and just, oh, yeah, yeah, give me that fruit. Let me reach for it. Because it sees what's implicit. Mm -hmm. And you contemplate it long enough. It will stop being scary because you recognize, well, there's nothing scary about an axe hanging over a random fruit. It becomes scary when my hand is in between the two or my head. So now, when you recognize the danger, you don't have to, well, you have to practice sense restraint because <coughs> of the habits. But when that's been thoroughly done, you don't have to then stop yourself from reaching. Just by having that context means mind will not be reaching. That's why the, the Buddha said, uh, one, the, whatever you frequently think and ponder that's what will become the inclination of your mind if you're frequently pondering about the taste of the fruit and how great it is and the texture well the mind isn't losing its broader context and it's becoming more obsessed and focused on the aspect of the taste the beauty the, the beauty, beauty exactly and but if you frequently contemplate the hanging axe mm. well then the mind is is is, is inclining towards oh avoiding that danger because it's factually dangerous so then restraint becomes effortless. You don't need to restrain yourself because you don't want to do it in the first place. 